It says that it's now streaming. Live. Yeah, but it's not. It's it's still it's still uploading. It's still at least from my point of view. All right. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tom, uh, for inviting and for getting this to happen together with Andrew. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's joining us here this evening. Uh, we're really happy to have Father Michael Butler here to give us a lecture of the history of the men's movement. Uh, I think we had the discussion, first of all, something like three, four months ago, actually, that oh, it'd be really good to kind of put together some kind of uh, background of how the men's movement happened and how it all started. And oh, we should probably ask uh, Michael around that because he's been doing it, this kind of stuff for a really long time. Um, and so then uh, things kind of uh, work together to, oh, it's International Men's Day coming up on the 19th. So let's get in the day before to get us off to a good start and, um, and do that. So yeah, I really appreciate the collaboration we've had with Andrew and Tom. Uh, Parallax is, uh, Tom is the curator and uh, founder of Parallax, which is a really good German and English speaking heterodox, um, uh, what do you call it, media uh, magazine online uh, with some great articles where Andrew's been publishing a lot of good stuff. And uh, we found a lot of common views and vision uh, in Manifesto and Parallax. This is our first uh, attempt to do something together. We're really happy about that. Um, and we're really happy that we can bring in Father Michael uh, to be uh, giving us a presentation this evening. So I met Father Michael for the first time, uh, I think in March this year or something like that. We were both driven online from this whole corona crisis. Uh, and we've had an incredibly valuable and productive uh, meeting so far. Uh, Michael played a really big role at the European Men's Gathering this, uh, this uh, August, where um, yeah, I think he really brought a level of depth and, and um, power into the rituals that we were doing there. Uh, and, and we really, uh, I think it, there's just been released a, a talk with Andrew, it's called On Pagans and Priests. And it was really amazing having these like pagan di guys dancing around the fire and then a, an Orthodox priest uh, blessing the fire with, with holy water or something like that. And we really enjoyed uh, seeing um, that working together in some ways, men from very different backgrounds, uh, kind of uh, exploring uh, how we're working together as men. Uh, and that's maybe something that the men's movement has been looking at for a long time. So we're really happy to uh, be uh, here and uh, looking forward to seeing what you have to share with us. So over to you. Oh, and by the way, there'll be a Q&A session at the end of this speech. Uh, so at the end of the lecture. Um, so please write down your questions in the chat. Uh, that you would like to have and, and you're welcome to write them as soon as you think of them you don't have to uh, wait with them but write down questions you have and we also want to request anybody guys if you're listening here please uh, turn on your camera so we can see you uh, it's really nice that's why we've kind of put you all up on the screen here it's nice to be able to talk to a panel of people where we can actually see each other instead of just being like these blank names on the screen so please if you're not naked or on the toilet uh, then switch on your camera uh, and we'll be able to uh, see you guys as well. If you have to keep it off, then that's of course understandable. Um, anything else, Andrew? Did I did I miss anything? I think no, we're good. We're good. Um, just uh, it's nice to have an audience again. So I'd repeat that idea that if if you if you felt uh, like you wanted to really be here, uh, cameras are great. So um, take it away, uh, Michael. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for Paul. Uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to do this. Thanks to Andrew for hosting it. Um, uh, I've enjoyed our collaborations that we've had in the past and I'm really looking forward to this one today. Uh, gentlemen, especially happy International Men's Day, which is about to come up. It's a nice opportunity. It's the first time I've ever done anything to celebrate it. And um, to talk about the history of the men's movement uh, is, uh, is a fine way to start. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now. I have a bit of a slideshow to show you. So um, we'll go ahead and move over to that and uh, we'll get started. Briefly, Briefly, the history of the men's movement. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today or this evening, excuse me, I'm six hours behind you. I'm over near Detroit in Michigan. So uh, uh, you'll forgive me if I get the times all wrong. Uh, but what we'll talk about, we'll cover probably most of an hour as, as long as we'll chat today. Uh, before questions and answers. Uh, we'll talk, look at the rise of feminism, which kind of gave rise to the contemporary men's movement. We'll look at uh, men's liberation and men's rights. 
there are a couple of, um, of movements that sought to reimagine masculinity. There were some Christian reactions to feminism uh, as well. And then uh, that's largely the history. Then we'll look at the men's movement today and look at just a number of just very disparate kind of um, expressions of what men are doing to help other men to optimize men's lives, to help others to become the best man that they could possibly be. Uh, there's a huge variety of stuff out there and a great richness that's available to us. I just want to highlight a few of those things uh, that are out there. And then uh, some thoughts for the future and a few seeds for getting our discussion going uh, for when we're done with my presentation. So those are the things that we'll, uh, that we'll do. All right. So on to the, uh, the basics of the, uh, of the presentation. <clears throat> uh, we can only throw together a sort of a pastiche of several uh, themes here. Uh, but getting men, especially young men, uh, to adapt to the rules and requirements of civilized society has always been a challenge. Viral restlessness, physicality, competitiveness, for example, have been trained and tamed by sports and games since before the time of writing. Games give the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker the feel of conflict and danger, even when times are peaceful and prosperous. Men have always been drawn to certain kinds of activities, and giving them some kind of a release valve for their natural aggression uh, is a healthy thing. Oddly enough, it makes men happy to do things that they enjoy. And societies have found ways for men to exert their virility constructively uh, or with at least a minimum of destruction and uh, of life and property. Uh, as men's labor has evolved over the last century and a half to be less physically demanding and fewer men are actively engaged in manual labor or farm farming, sports, had become even more popular. College athletics, professional sports blossomed everywhere. Hobbies like woodworking and hunting and other outdoors activities have been promoted as manly pursuits. The Boy Scouts were established in 1910. Social clubs and lodges gave uh, men a place apart from women where they could do their things and enjoy the company of other men. Men bought pulp fiction magazines filled with lurid tales of exotic adventures they knew that they would never have themselves. And later, they bought Superman comic books. And it wasn't long after that the entire Marvel and DC comic universes were born. That's where we are today, right? Men marveled at the turn of the last century at strong men like Eugene Sandow, and later at weightlifters like John Anderson who was the first Olympic weightlifter. Later on, wrestlers and bodybuilders. With fewer opportunities for their own manly action, men were increasingly drawn to virile display. Masculinity became even more vicarious, virtual, and symbolic. We find our heroes in sports and in movies now. Boys who had worked next to their fathers for centuries saw that never now saw dad leave home and go off to the factory or to the office to work at God knows what, and boys were left to the care of women and to education by women. The transition to a service and knowledge work economy has only made things worse. The modern cubicle feels like a cage to a lot of men, and while some men are particularly suited to knowledge work or they find other outlets for their energy, the so-called jobs of the future feel soul-crushing to a lot of men and leave a lot of men inwardly dead. And by the way, this is a point that I think Manifesto should be actively considering how to help men who are actively engaged in, in knowledge industry nowadays and how to reach them in their soul. Maybe it's why the term retrosexual all but replaced the term metrosexual in the lifestyle sections of national magazines in the early 2000s, which are full of stories about affluent urbanites who took to wearing hunting garb, buying designer axes, and writing about the art of manliness on blogs with names like, well, the art of manliness, which by the way, if you don't know the art of manliness, I commend it to you, it's a fantastic resource. Throwback masculinity dominated other media as well. The dangerous book for boys and shop class as soul craft topped men's reading lists and television shows like Dirty Jobs, Axe Men and Deadliest Catch romanticized for us again, hard physical labor. Add to all this, the introduction of the birth control pill, the rise of feminism, calls for equality, the entry of millions of women into the workforce, 
the loss of male-only organizations and spaces, no-fault divorce laws, and it is no wonder that men felt ill at ease and even under assault. Traditionally manly virtues like strength and courage and honor were desexualized and reinterpreted in more relative terms so that even the weakest boy or the meekest girl could feel strong, courageous, or honorable. This is the day when everybody gets a trophy. To explain women's historical lack of achievement, feminists painted all men as bullies and railed against the so-called patriarchy. Women appropriated everything they wanted from thousands of years of, of male culture, and men were allowed to cobble together a collective identity from what was left. Just basically empty macho posturing, fart jokes, and beer. Or as a friend of mine put it, bacon and boobs are all we have left. By the mid-1980s, feminists were calling for androgyny to replace gender stereotypes, and the New York Times was actually running articles calling for the chemical castration of all men as a way of fighting crime. The new world of women downplayed the importance of physical differences between the sexes and praised women for their communication skills, their ability to multitask, and their preference for social coalition building and nonviolent conflict resolution. The new way of women celebrated female empowerment and the importance of women in shaping history and chronicles their rise to prominence as a peaceful overcoming of oppression guided by a genuine desire for justice and equality. Women were taught to take pride in womanhood and they expect to be able to do just about anything they set their hearts to it. The problem with the new age of women, of course, is that it relies on a transfer of power and opportunity from men. And if that power exchange is to last, men will have to be taught to curb their expectations, even as women are taught to expect the world. The sentiment of feminists was that feminism would be a success if only men would cooperate by abandoning their own manly interests and curbing their own biological impulses. The fact is that feminism is a failed ideology because it asks men to participate in their own extinction. Not only this, but feminism asks men to raise successive generations of boys and men to participate in their own degradation. And I don't know about you, but I don't want any part of it. Out of this social brew of the 60s and 70s, along with men's liberation and gay liberation, the men's liberation movement emerged. Groups and organizations of men and their allies focused on gender issues and offered everything from self-help and support to lobbying and political activism. The men's movement is made up of several streams that have differing and often very conflicting goals. Major components include the men's liberation movement, the pro-feminist men's movement, the mythopoeic men's movement, the men's rights movement, and the Christian men's movement. Some of these movements attempted to rethink or reimagine masculinity in a way that reputed the old, violent, patriarchal myths about men and provide a more peaceful and sexually egalitarian vision of manhood that is more in line with what women want for themselves. This is what two groups, the mythopoeic men's movement and the male feminists, tried to do in the 1980s and the 90s. Others saw feminism as a threat and reacted to it. This is where we get the men's rights movement. <clears throat> and there were Christian reactions to feminism as well. And we'll say something about all of them as we go along. So at the beginning, if you can't beat them, join them. As I said, the men's liberation movement originated in the United States and in Great Britain as a response to the cultural changes of the 1960s and 70s, including the growth of the feminist movement, the hippie counterculture, women and gays liberation movements, and the sexual revolution. Jack Sawyer published an article titled On Male Liberation in Liberation Journal in August of 1970, in which he discussed the negative effects of stereotypes of male sex roles. 1971 saw the birth of men's discussion groups across the United States, as well as the formation uh, by Warren Farrell of the National Task Force on the Masculine Mystique. Uh, the men's liberation movement kind of petered out by the end of the 70s decade. But out of it came another organization called the National Organa Organization for Men Against Sexism. Uh, it has been advocating what we now call intersectional pro-feminism since 1975. It's an activist organization of men and women supporting positive changes for men. 
Nomas advocates a perspective that is pro-feminist, gay affirmative, anti-racist, dedicated to enhancing men's lives, and committed to justice on a broad range of social issues, including class, age, religion, and physical abilities. They affirm that working to make this nation's, the American nation's ideals of equality substantive is the finest expression of what it means to be a man. Out of the early men's liberation movement uh, comes a particular figure who is uh, fundamental to our understanding of the development of men's rights and the men's movement. This is Dr. Warren Farrell, and he deserves a little consideration and word on his own here. Uh, he started out as a feminist, and when second wave of the men's movement evolved in the late 60s, uh, Farrell's support of it led the National Organization for Women to ask him to form a men's chapter. The response to that group led to us ultimately forming some 300 additional men and women's groups around the United States. And he is the only man that was actually elected to the board of directors of the National Organization of Women three years running. Although today he is generally considered one of the fathers of the men's movement, he advocates, quote, there should be neither a women's movement blaming men nor a men's movement blaming women but a gender liberation movement freeing both sexes from the rigid roles of the past toward a more flexible role for their future. Farrell parted ways with the National Organization of Women in the mid 1970s, um, now changed his position on divorce laws. And he said this, everything went well between him and the feminist uh, until the mid seventies when now came out against the presumption of joint custody for children in a divorce. I couldn't believe that people I thought were pioneers in equality were saying that women should have the first option to have children or not to have children, that children should not have equal rights to their dad. And it was over that issue that he separated from them and so much for equality. Farrell's books, Women Can't Hear What Men Don't Say, which is about communication, Why Men Earn More, which is about the wage gap, The Boy Crisis, the Myth of Male Power, which was an international bestseller, and Why Men Are the Way They Are, are rightly considered foundational text in the men's movement. And uh, you know, for those of you who are history buffs about this sort of stuff, those are fine places to begin. As women's liberation evolved into women's rights and gay liberation evolved into gay rights, so too men's liberation evolved into men's rights in the early 70s. Its focus was on social issues and government services that adversely impact or discriminate against men and boys. Many of them the very issues that second wave feminism were actively promoting at the time. These include things like the favor given to women in family law in things like child custody and alimony and distribution of property, parenting, reproduction, male suicide and domestic violence against men, circumcision, inequalities in education, forced military conscription, the lack of social safety nets for men, and healthcare policies. Prominent in the men's rights movement was A Voice for Men. Their website says, it is the mission of A Voice for Men to promote educational and encouragement to men and boys, to lift them above the din of misandry, to reject the unhealthy demands of gynocentrism in all of its forms, and to promote their mental, physical, and financial well-being without compromise or apology. A Voice for Men got to be very strident in what it did. Uh, in early 2011, they created a website called Register Her, which was a Wikipedia page that initially listed the names, addresses, and other personal information of women who were convicted of murdering or raping men. The registry expanded over time to include women considered by the site's operators to be guilty of false rape accusations or anti-male bigotry. These men went after them hard. Under the motto, why are these women not in jail? The site also published personally identifying information about women who participated in protests against the men's rights movement, mocked it on social media, or who voiced feminist supportive ideas. All right. So much for some of the uh, of the men's rights folks. Uh, let's switch gears now uh, and look at a couple of movements that sought, uh, rather than to fight with feminism, uh, to reimagine what masculinity might be uh, in light of the feminist movement. And these are the ones here: the mythopoeic men's movement and the pro-feminist men's movement. <clears throat> with the mythopoeic movement, 
of course, we have to start with Robert Bly, the American poet who was a close cultural observer beginning in the 1950s. Uh, by the 70s, he saw that something was going on with men and it concerned him greatly. Through workshops and retreats with men, he began to get a sense that something was not right. And in 1990, he published his well-known book there, Iron John, a book about men. It actually spent 64 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and his popularity was bolstered in the same year by a 90 minute television interview with Bill Moyers called A Gathering of Men that allowed Bly to talk about his book with men or talk about his work with men and help to popularize the book. Uh, Iron John, if you're not familiar with it, is one of Grimm's fairy tales, which Robert Bly analyzes in a masterful way to show how young men can reg uh, regain their personal power and grow up by tapping into the power of the archetypal wild man who resides deep in each one of us. Now, it's not surprising that a poet would use story, myth, poetry, and body work to get around men's typical rationality and into a more intuitive, symbolic, and somatic way of knowing. It helped men get out of their heads, to access more of their emotions, to feel more present in their bodies. It allowed men to explore broader emotional ranges than just feeling angry or horny. And in the early days, Dealing with sorrow or grief was a huge part of men's work. It introduced archetypal and transpersonal aspects of masculinity. The use of male-only gatherings made for openness and honesty by creating a safe, contained, and boundaried space in which men could heal their past wounds, consider their present, and creatively forge a better future. In the introduction to Iron John, Bly describes the men he's trying to help. His description is often quoted, and it's worth repeating here because, as you will see, not a whole lot has changed with men in the last 50 years. In the 70s, he says, I began to see all over the country a phenomenon that we might call the soft male. Sometimes even today, when I look out at an audience, perhaps half the young men are what I'd call soft. They're lovely, valuable people. I like them. And they're not interested in harming the earth or starting wars. There's a gentle attitude toward life and their whole being and their style of being. Uh, what he's talking about here are what were commonly called snags, sensitive new age guys, okay? And uh, they are with us to this very day. But many of these men are not happy, Bly goes on to say. You quickly notice a lack of energy in them. They're life preserving, but they're not exactly life giving. Ironically, you often see these men with strong women who positively radiate energy. I first learned about the anguish of the soft men when they told me their stories in early men's gatherings. In 1980, the Lama community in New Mexico asked me to teach a conference for men only, their first, 1980, the first year for a men's conference, in which about 40 men participated. Each day we concentrated on one Greek God and one old story, and then late in the afternoon we gathered to talk. When the younger men spoke, it was not uncommon for them to be weeping within five minutes. The amount of grief and anguish in these younger men was astonishing to me. Part of their grief wrote out of, arose out of the remoteness from their fathers, which they felt keenly. But partly, too, grief arose from trouble in their marriages and relationships. They had learned to be receptive, but receptivity wasn't enough to carry their marriages through troubled times. In every relationship, something fierce is needed once in a while. Both the man and the woman need to have it, but at the point where it was needed, often the young man came up short. He was nurturing, but something else was required for his relationship as far as, and for his life. The soft male was able to say, I feel your pain, I consider your life as important as mine, and I will take care of you and comfort you. But when, what he could not say was what he wanted and stick with it. Resolve of that kind was a different matter. As I say, not much has changed in 50 years. Bly went on to host a number of men's conferences around the United States beginning in the 70s. The Minnesota Men's Conference is the largest and best known of them. He started it in 1984. It continues to this day, 35 years later. Uh, our own European men's gathering is a direct descendant of exactly the kind of things that Bly was doing uh, 30, 40 years ago uh, in rural places in California and Minnesota. Okay, so that's our, that's our background for that. Of course, 
feminists saw the Mythopoeic men's movement and Iron John as a kind of resurgent male sexism, and they mocked it ruthlessly. The fact that middle-aged white guys were indeed drumming and wearing masks and appropriating Native American and other indigenous rituals and running around naked in the woods gave feminists plenty of fuel for the fire. But Bly had put his finger on a real and genuine problem, one that persists to our own days. We are still surrounded by soft males. We call them soy boys, beta males, and nice guys now, who are still full of grief and anguish, still remote from their fathers, still have trouble in their marriages and relationships. They lack something fierce and they lack resolve and they know it and they don't know where to find it. And Bly was offering a way out. Still, there are some valid criticisms of the Mythopoeic men's movement. Uh, I think Jack Donovan's critique, for example, has some merit. He says, Bly understood some of the problems that men and boys were facing, sure. His solutions were forced and his new agey tone had limited appeal. The idea of grown men going out into the woods to sit in drum circles, read poetry, and talk about their feelings was cringeworthy. It also seemed spoiled and self-indulgent. But the biggest problem with Bly's reimagining of masculinity was that it lacked balls. Bly wrote of swords and battle, but his battles were the bloodless cartoon fantasies of the most innocent inner child, not the real bloody conflicts of men. His youth of myth was selectively biased. Bly advocated the cultivation of an inner warrior, but belittles the men whose job it is to make war as mere soldiers. Bly's new age inner warrior was told to assert himself, but he could only do so with words. He couldn't back it up. In short, he was impotent. On to the next ones, the pro-feminist men's movement. Another approach, to reimagining masculinity was the pro-feminist men's movement. In 1996, Michael Kimmel here wrote his most influential work, Manhood in America, A Cultural History. Kimmel constructed a history of changing ideals of, of manhood uh, in America from the Revolutionary War in 1776 down to the present, saying that his book is less about what boys and men actually did than about what they were told they were supposed to do and what happened to them when they followed through. Kimmel asserts that at the close of the 20th century, the model of the self-made man, which is a very much an American ideal, led more than ever to chronic anxiety and insecurity. As a remedy, he urged men to abandon the failed quest to prove their masculinity through self-control, exclusion, and escape. Kimmel insists that we need a new definition of masculinity for a new century, and that it should uh, be a democratic manhood, which means a gender of a, a gender politics of inclusion, of standing up against injustice based on difference. His recommendation is to change the meaning of manhood from an identity based on competition, domination, and power to one based on accountability, responsibility, and hope. Kimmel stressed that he is not calling for a kind of androgyny a blurring of masculinity and femininity. Instead, he says, we have to begin to imagine a world of equality in which we also embrace and celebrate difference. Um, moreover, Kimmel believes that men will be helped in this transformation by the very people they have tried so desperately to keep out, feminist women, gay men and lesbians, and people of color. Kimmel concludes, the battle to prove manhood is a battle that can never be won. Only by renouncing the battle itself can we American men come home from our wars, heal our wounds, and breathe a collective sigh of relief. Well, it sounds good. Personally, I find Kimmel's solution is just a little too easy and a little too simplistic. All we have to do is explain to men that they need to give up trying to be self-made men and quit trying to be competitive and dominating and to give up all of their power uh, and e embrace egalitarianism and celebrate difference. Um, it sounds good on paper, but there's no oomph, there's no emphasis behind it, and what do men get out of it, uh, ultimately? And it seems to fly in the face of men's nature and experience, uh, and like all ideologies, I doubt that it will work. Briefly, any attempt to reimagine masculinity is going to founder on the rocks of reality and human nature. Let's look on to uh, some Christ the primary Christian responses 
uh, to the feminist movement. They were myriad. There were all kinds of responses from various Christian churches and groups to what feminism was putting forward. Uh, but there are two primary ones that gained large traction and are worth mentioning here. The first one was the Promise Keepers, uh, or PK, it was, it was popularly called. It was founded in 1990 by uh, Bill McCartney, who was the head football coach of the University of Colorado in Boulder. So we have a head football coach at one of the Big Ten American universities. This is an important dude in uh, American male culture. Uh, he was a recent convert to evangelical Christianity at the time, and he envisioned football stadiums for training and teaching on what it means to be godly men. He had a few things that Robert Bly didn't have, like strong leadership and organizational skills and access to some really serious funding. And so he succeeded at what he set out to do. In July of 1990, 72 men gathered for the per first Promise Keepers event. The next year, 4,200 attended. By the mid-1990s, events were being held in major cities all over the United States with attendance in the tens of thousands. Uh, in 1995, by the way, I myself attended the Promise Keepers rally at the Pontiac Silverdome near Detroit, Michigan with 75,000 other men. Uh, at that point in my life, it was the largest gathering I had ever been in, and the energy in that room was simply astonishing. Uh, the, high point, the highlight of, uh, the, uh, um, of the Promise Keepers events or the movement came the next year in, or in 1997 when Promise Keepers supporters estimated at 800,000 filled the National Mall in Washington, D.C. for an event called Stand in the Gap a sacred assembly of men. Uh, financial difficulty saw to the demise of the Promise Keepers organization a year later. And while it continues to exist to this day, it doesn't have nearly uh, the reach or the impact that it had uh, back in the 90s. Of course, feminists saw the Promise Keepers as knee-jerk Christian Neanderthals and howled at the notion of men leading their households according to the biblical injunction. Uh, Bill McCartney himself also publicly, publicly upheld the Bible's condemnation of homosexuality, which earned him and the Promise keep Keepers blistering critique in the press. On the other hand, Promise Keepers in their fundamental planks uh, pushed for racial equality and um, uh, overcoming racial barriers, and they were remarkably successful at that successfully integrating white, black, and Hispanic uh, men at all of their events and doing a great deal for racial healing in the evangelical churches. So we have to give them credit for at least that. A decade later, a Christian counselor named John Eldridge launched an independent ministry to focus on the needs of men. In 2001, he released his book, Wild at Heart, Discovering the Secrets of a Man's Soul. The book sold more than 4 million copies in the United States alone, and 20 years later, I checked this on Amazon just the other day, it is still the number one men's book in Christian men's issues and men's gender studies. 20 years later, it still has that place. Like Robert Bly, who spoke about the wild man, Eldridge's message of being wild at heart resonated very strongly with American Christian men who felt uncomfortable and unappreciated in their increasingly feminized churches. He wrote, when all is said and done, I think most men in the church believe that God then put them on the earth to be a good boy. I think most, the problem with men, we are told, is that they don't know how to keep their promises, clearly a reference to the promise keepers, or to be spiritual leaders or how to talk to their wives or how to raise their children. Basically, Christian men are a bunch of losers. But if they'll try real hard, they can reach the lofty summit of becoming a nice guy. That's what we hold up as models of Christian maturity, really nice guys. We don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't swear. That's what makes us men. Now, let me ask my male readers something. In all your boyhood dreams growing up, did you ever dream of becoming a nice guy? He's got a point. Eldridge's vision for authentic masculinity involved three things, a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. He worked hard to demolish the popular image of Jesus as the wimpy bearded lady. And I give him serious kudos for that because I can't stand that kind of image either. And thank God my own church has largely spared it. He asked really tough questions of his readers. And for illustrations in his book, he did not turn first to examples from the Bible. 
Instead, he used action and adventure movies, Braveheart, Saving Private Ryan, Top Gun, the Die Hard films, Gladiator, Star Wars, movies with situations that men could aspire to, and he used them brilliantly. As a footnote, for all of you engaged in men's work yourself, take a, take a, a page from what John Eldridge did. The use of, of, of appropriate video clips is very powerful in working with men and genuinely helpful for getting substantive points across in ways that men can really resonate with. He was absolutely brilliant with that. Elridge parlayed Wild at Heart into a series of books for both men and women and began holding several boot camps every year for both sexes in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Those boot camps continue today with long waiting lists to attend. Uh, I'll mention for myself, I attended one in, in 2003, along with uh, about 450 other men. Uh, during one presentation, they showed a scene from a movie I had not seen before a scene which was so personally applicable that it reduced me to uncontrollable sobbing for 45 minutes. Uh, it was one of the most transformative moments of my life. And I give John Eldridge credit uh, for the help which he offered me at that moment. There are numerous cottage industries of Christian men's organizations and groups now uh, that we can't bother to mention, but uh, these were the two biggies and I wanted to say something about them. So we've looked at the men's liberation, at men's rights, the mythopoeic, the pro-feminist men's movements, and a couple of Christian ones. That much kind of for ancient history. What about today? What's going on out there in the world for men's work today? There are a lot of aspects to it, largely, again, thanks to internet and social media. And we can highlight only a few of them here. Uh, I chose these mostly for their variety, uh, not necessarily for their size or their importance. There are things which I knew about and uh, uh, my apologies up front for leaving out your favorites uh, as we go along. Uh, feel free to mention them when we come to discussion time later. Uh, first, we ought to say something about International Men's Day, of course, since we're celebrating that. Uh, there's been a call for an International Men's Day since the 1960s. Why do women have an international celebration and not men? Men's contributions and concerns deserve a day of recognition in their own right proposed objectives um, uh, for International Men's Day uh, focus on things like men and boys' health, improving gender relations, promoting gender equality, and highlighting positive uh, male role models. Uh, there were a lot of attempts to start an International Men's Day uh, that received little response in the 70s and 80s. And it wasn't until November 19th in 1999 in Trinidad and Tobago, of all places, that International Men's Day began to get international traction. The new event received overwhelming support and became very popular initially in the Caribbean. And from there, it spread around the world. And we celebrate it now today, thanks to their initiative. Second, the Australian Men's Shed Association, this from their website. It was established in 2007. Their motto is, men don't talk face to face, they talk shoulder to shoulder, which I think is right. The modern men's shed is an updated version of the shed in the backyard that has long been a part of Australian culture. Men's sheds are found in many cities and towns around Australia and continue to spring up internationally. <clears throat> a men's shed is any community-based, non-profit, non-commercial organization that is accessible to all men and whose primary activity is the provision of a safe and friendly environment where men are able to work on meaningful projects at their own pace, in their own time, in the company of other men. A major objective is to advance the well-being and health of their male members. Uh, very often in them, as you see in one of the photographs there, uh, there's a place to sit down, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of tea, and simply jaw. Uh, but they've proven to be extremely popular in Australia and increasingly popular internationally. Other kinds of men's organizations include uh, veterans help uh, groups. Doubtless, there are many veterans help organizations in countries around the world. I just want to mention one that I'm aware of that surely you don't know. Just, just an as an example of what simple creativity and thoughtfulness can be used to help men who are in need. This one is called Warriors in Quiet Waters, and it's an organization in Bozeman, Montana, that helps post 9-11 combat vet veterans and their loved ones rekindle their love for the outdoors through fly fishing. 
of all things. It is a handicap accessible lodge on 112 acres in the northern Rocky Mountains in Montana, located near some of the world's most beautiful fly fishing streams and rivers. I know because I've been there and seen them. Here, wounded warriors find themselves in a peaceful environment with volunteers and professional fishing guides in a setting that is far removed from the typical routines of hospitals, doctors, and rehab centers, and certainly far from the horrors of combat. The purpose of the program is the long-term healing and reintegration of post 9-11 veterans through learning a new skill, namely fly fishing, and restoring them to a sense of peace and purpose that is often lost after a tour of duty overseas. On the opposite end of the spectrum, from uh, peaceful fly fishing and the quiet of nature, we have another expression in the contemporary men's movement. That is Jack Donovan and the neo-pagan or tribal masculinity, uh, which he promotes. Jack Donovan has been writing and speaking about masculinity, masculine philosophy, and spirituality for over a decade. His foundational book, The Way of Men, has sold over 100,000 copies worldwide. Part treatise and part polemic, The Way of Men uses history and evolutionary psychology to explain primal masculinity and what he calls the four tactical virtues of men, strength, courage, mastery, and honor. It is well worth reading, as are the two subsequent volumes, Becoming a Barbarian and a More Complete Beast. He is a regular podcaster and author. Donovan himself is a very controversial figure, an outspoken gay man who hates gay culture, a former priest of the Church of Satan. He is currently a proponent of Northern European neo-paganism. Prior to his resignation from the organization in late 2018, he was an outspoken supporter of the Wolves of Vinland, a Norse neo-pagan group in Virginia, whose members routinely post photos of ritual animal slaughter on Instagram, and one of whose members has been convicted of setting fire to a black church. Neo-pagan groups like the Wolves of Vinland and Operation Werewolf cultivate an ethos of being social outcasts, like many biker gangs. They forge bonds of brotherhood through rejection of the modern world, honoring the old gods whom they believe embody their ideas of manhood, and devotion to a kind of physical hypermasculinity that emphasizes heavyweight training in martial arts. Uh, I happen to know someone who is a member of one of these organizations, and I am told that some of their gatherings include ritualized mandatory fist fights unto the shedding of blood. So it's a rough group. Uh, to belong to. And while I don't condone their beliefs or their practices, it is absolutely fascinating to me to see where men look for ideas of manhood, meaning, and community. And perhaps in spite of his association with such groups, Jack Donovan's writings seem to resonate well with men, and I still recommend his books to you. Online, with the rise of the internet, pro-male interest groups proliferated along with all the other interest groups. A broad, loose coalition, coalition of men's interest groups, blogs, and web, websites garnered the name The Manosphere in 2009. It's a collection of websites, blogs, and other online forums that promote some kinds of traditional or reactionary masculinity, are sometimes hostile to women, and are definitely hostile towards feminism. Politically, the manosphere is diverse, but it tends towards libertarian, far-right, alt-right, and anarcho-nihilistic views. The manosphere includes movements such as the contemporary men's rights movement, fathers' rights groups, but its largest constituency is a group of sites dedicated to helping men with relationships, dating, and sexuality. So major players in the manosphere include pickup artists, men going their own way, the red pill, and the unfortunate group we call the incels, the involuntary celibates. Pickup artists, self-identified dating coaches, the seduction community, the pickup community, is a movement of men whose goal is the seduction and sexual success with women. Modern pickup artists practice date, uh, 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 dates from at least 1970, when Eric Weber first published his book, How to Pick Up Girls. The pickup artist community itself originated with Ross Jeffries and his students. In the late 80s, he taught workshops, promoted a collection of neuro-linguistic programming techniques that he called speed seduction, 
and published a short book on his techniques, How to Get the Women You, Want, you Desire Into Bed. Uh, other exponents of pickup artistry established themselves at roughly the same time, but they lacked contact with each other. In 94, Louis de Payne, then a student of Jeffrey's, founded a news group back in the day when there were news groups uh, that in turn spawned a network of other internet discussion forums, email lists, blogs, and sites where seduction techniques could be exchanged. In 2005, Neil Strauss published The Game, Penetrating the Secret Society of Pickup Artists. The game reached the top New York Times bestseller list, actually, and made pickup techniques known to a wider audience. Many pickup artists work on their game by improving their understanding of psychology, their confidence and self-esteem, which they call their inner game, as well as improving their social skills and physical appearance, physical fitness, fashion, sense, and grooming, which is called outer game. And many members of the community believe that they can improve their game by regular practice and interaction with women. The Red Pill. The Red Pill is a Reddit site dedicated to the discussion of sexual strategy in a culture increasingly lacking a positive identity for men. In its early days, the Red Pill, or TRP as it's called, was a direct outgrowth of the pickup artist community. Men who had tried pickup techniques or had found other ways of having success with women began comparing notes on online forums on what worked and what didn't work for them. Out of this note sharing, a community evolved and a set of theories were developed about contemporary sexual marketplace and people's sexual market value, discovered that men and women have differing mating strategies. They came up with a notion of female hypergamy that women tended to marry and date up the social ladder and that uh, they sought the kind of masculine traits that are genuinely attractive to women. Learning and internalizing this set of theories about how interpersonal relationships really work is what is meant by swallowing the red pill. You know the reference to the matrix. Because red pill theory flies in the face of a lot of popular gynocentric cultural understanding about the ways that relationships between men and women work, uh, when men, when they first swallow the red pill, often become very angry. And whereas Robert Bly dealt with men's grief in the 90s, 30 years later, the red pill community deals a lot with men's anger. Okay? In the red pill community, simple pickup techniques were eventually abandoned for more substantial consideration of what makes a man of quality, the kind of men that other men would actually respect and that men, women actually want to be around. Fundamentals like optimizing your physique through rigorous exercise and a clean diet, attention to good grooming and fashion, basic communication skills and assertiveness were summed up with the model, motto, be attractive, don't be unattractive. Young men especially are taught that self-esteem and confidence are the most attractive thing about them and that these traits are founded on accomplishment, on building muscle, getting good grades in school, working hard, working on their jobs, taking up a side hustle, learning to sell, practicing approaching women, gaining life experience, finding mentors, and generally finding their mission in life and developing themselves as best they possibly can. Doing these things not only improve their lives for themselves, but also makes them genuinely attractive to women. You see, confident, assertive, successful men don't need cheesy pickup lines to attract women. They only need to walk into the room. And that's what the red pill was fundamentally about. Rollo Tomasi, whose book, The Rational Male, is the grandfather of the red pill theories and uh, is foundational for understanding the entire movement. He has a very popular podcast uh, to this day and a widely read website, uh, also called The Rational Male. On the little less happy note, we have men going their own way, often pronounced MGTOW from the abbreviation. Probably emerged in the early 2000s. A blog called No Man was one of the first sites dedicated to the solid ideology, publishing a MGTOW manifesto in 2001. Earlier members of the community were largely libertarian. That is, they were vehemently opposed to the government having any say uh, about interpersonal relationships, especially marriage, because they were opposed to being uh, what they call divorce rate 
uh, by their wives, where their wives would divorce them, take the house, take the car, take the kids and have their income and, and leave them with nothing. So they tended to be sort of libertarian in their views. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, who was famous a few years ago, uh, is credited with helping to popularize the MIGTO movement in 2014 when he wrote an article for Breitbart entitled The Sexodus, in which he described men who were giving up on women, love, sex, and marriage because of feminism. MIGTO groups tend to be misogynist and anti-feminist, believing that feminism has made women dangerous to men and that male self-preservation requires dissociating completely from them. They believe there is a systematic gynocentric bias against men, including double standards in gender roles and bias against men in family courts. There are various levels of involvement with this particular strain of, uh, of men. Uh, there are the situationally aware who have taken the red pill, which we've already seen, and accept some of the tenets of the MGTOW ideology, uh, namely things like that gender equality is a lie. They sometimes believe marriage can be worthwhile if you're careful in selecting a wife. Others abstain from long-term relationships, cohabitation, and marriage, but will still participate in short-term relationships and sexual encounters with women. Some abstain even from short-term relationships and casual sex. The most extreme attempt to reduce their economic engagement with society as a whole, the idea being that society is hopelessly gynocentric and any engagement with it helps and promotes the social feminine imperative. Incels. <clears throat> Short for involuntary celibates are members of an online subculture uh, who define themselves as unable to find a romantic or sexual apart, uh, uh, partner despite wanting one. The first online community to use the term incel was in 1993, when a Canadian university student uh, by her name Alana, it was actually a woman, uh, created a website in order to discuss her sexual inactivity with others. In the 2000s, incel communities became more extremist as they adopted behaviors common to forums like 4chan and Reddit, where extremist posts were encouraged as a way to achieve visibility in the community. Discussions in incel forums are often characterized by resentment, misogyny, misanthropy, self-pitying and self-loathing, racism, a sense of entitlement to sex, and the endorsement of violence against sexually active people. These are not happy men. In distinction from the red pill, this is known as the black pill. The black pill generally refers to a set of commonly held beliefs in incel communities, which include biological determinism, fatalism, and defeatism for unattractive people. An incel who has taken the black pill has adopted the belief that he is hopeless and that his lack of success romantically and sexually is permanent, regardless of any change he makes in his life or to his physical appearance or personality. Incels are mostly male, heterosexual, and white. Estimates of the overall size of the subculture vary greatly, ranging from thousands to hundreds of thousands. At least six mass murders, resulting in a total of 44 deaths, have been committed since 2014 by men who have either self-identified as incels or who have mentioned incel-related names and writings in their own writings or on internet postings. <clears throat> in some communities, it is common for posts to glorify violence by self-identified incels, such as Elliot Roger here, who perpetrated the 2014 Isla Vista killings in California, and Alec Manassian, uh, the 2018 Toronto van uh, attack suspect. Roger is the most frequently referenced with incels offering, often referring to him as Saint Roger and sharing memes in which his face has been superimposed upon paintings of Christian icons. Some incels consider him to be the true progenitor of today's online incel communities. Some incels see violence as the only solution to what they see as social oppression and abuse against them, and they speak frequently of incel uprisings and revolts. Other incels take the more, ne the more nihilistic view, yes, there's an even darker view, that nothing will change society, even violent acts. Some incels support the idea of violence as revenge on society without the hope that it will lead to societal change. Uh, the tragedy of Elliot Rogers' life and his victims and others like them underscore the absolute importance of men's work I think, especially in the lives of younger men. 
because very often they, they fit the paradigms that we often talk about in men's circles of men, young men who grow up without fathers, uh, without stable home life, you know, and, and other the afflictions that, that typically characterize uh, troubled young men. But, you know, I do, so I don't leave my presentation on a sour note. A uh, couple of more minutes and I will be done here. Uh, it's worth mentioning, at least in passing, the positive work that's being done by men's organizations, communities, gatherings, workshops, retreats, conferences, therapists, and specialists all over the world. You are all doing incredible work if you are involved in this, improving the lives of men, and in some cases, saving their lives literally as well. And I thank you for all that you do, because I am familiar with uh, what most of these organizations here do. I know that, that some of you uh, have, have association with them, and my hat is off to you for the good things that you're doing. Also, thanks again to Andrew Sweeney for hosting us tonight on the eve of International Men's Day and his willingness to promote male positive programming. And thanks to Paul Robson and Manifesto for co-hosting my talk. So where do we go from here? Men don't, most men don't challenge the effects of their socialization and, and conditioning. Uh, they prefer to cope as best they can with the challenges that life throws at them. Um, a, tough, a tough it out attitude that contributes to the statistics of violence, suicide, drug and alcohol addiction, premature death, depression, divorce, and all the other signs that toughing it out is really not the best answer for us. Despite the proliferation of men's groups, men's service providers, retreats, workshops, gatherings, all the stuff that, that, that we do, most of these groups are still struggling to attract and engage men. The rapid spread of men's sheds across Australia is a notable exception, and maybe there's something we can learn from the men's shed movement about how to attra be attractive to men and to get them into our programs and to see what we have to say. The chief problem with getting men into men's work is that men's groups and gatherings or retreat are actually kind of scary for most guys, uh, although it's usually not expressed as a fear. The prospect of being in a group of unknown men and having to self-disclose something about yourself with the possibility of being shamed or criticized really doesn't hold a lot of attraction for a lot of guys. <clears throat> Generally speaking, men who do attend men's events are those who have been through some kind of crisis already gotten through it and are prepared to take a look at the parts of their own lives that maybe contributed to the original problem. Moreover, as Michael Kimmel pointed out in his book, Manhood in America, the mythopoeic call of the wild runs into the same problems that were faced by early 20th century uh, masculinists in America, namely that it displaces men's grown up problems of economic contraction, political competition, social isolation, and interpersonal incompetence onto over-dominant motherhood and absent fatherhood. And while it may be a good exercise intellectually to find the root causes of men's problems, be they industrialization, absent fathers, feminism, or any other causes real or imaginary, ultimately, if we're going to attract men and help them, we need to meet them where they are and offer them real world solutions to their problems. We need to address men's issues directly the economic contraction, political competition, social isolation, and interpersonal incompetence that Kimmel mentions in ways that don't cater to the ideologies du jour, that recognize men's problems and offer genuine solutions, and don't just pay lip service to the problems, that broaden men's capacities to function in the world and to enjoy life and relationships more fully, that recognize and value traditional male attributes like strength and courage and mastery honor, aggressiveness, and competition, and find ways of channeling those things productively instead of pathologizing them, that give men real resources for how to be strong and manly, physically strong and healthy, mentally and emotionally strong and successful, and that helps them to be fierce when they need to be. We also already know the statistics. We know about men taking their lives, men getting killed, mental illness, the prison sentences, homeless men, the dangerous low, jo low, low level jobs, workplace deaths, falling academic grades. We do not hear as much about the divorce statistics of men whose wives divorce them and they don't want to be divorced. Their infertility, infertility rates among men, the low and declining testosterone levels, the false abuse claims leveled against men, and the misery of men in sexless marriages 
or the routine drugging of our sons for attention deficit disorder. There's a lot we're doing already, to be sure. There's a lot more that can be done. How can we address some or all of these issues in effective ways? I look forward to that conversation. And that is all that I have to say right now. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I have not been able in my presentation to monitor questions or comments, but I'm real curious to see what y'all all have to say now. Thanks much. Michael, uh, thank you so much. Um, that was really wonderful. Thank you, um, thank you. Can you, can everybody hear me well? Is, is, is my voice clear here? Great. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to say that what I really appreciated about your presentation was how you presented the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? You, you gave us a, a full spectrum here. Okay. Yeah, and before I op open this up to, to, to Q and A, I just have one question uh, for you. And that is how do we pre present, uh, prevent the men's movement groups that we're in from becoming cultish? Or separatists, or or because it feels to me that the the, the move when the men move, men's movements get uh, pathologized, it's when they separate from women on, on some level in some profound way, like when they they become uh, uh, when they, they become a, a cult. Uh, so okay. so that's that's my question for you. All right, I, I think I think the easy answer to that uh, is probably the difference between a group that is reactive and responsive. Uh, groups that are reactive are going to circle the wagons, feel besieged, set upon, uh, and, and will turn inward. Uh, they will be the groups that need a, a victim or an opponent who is them over there. And you know, in the case of men's movements, it'll probably be them women. Uh, if a group is formed precisely to be responsive, to look at situations and to be open to, to solutions, I think there's, there is still benefit in male-only spaces. Uh, as we all know, when you know we get a bunch of our buddies together, we all talk differently than we do when there are women present. Um, and there's a certain degree of honesty and openness that we have. So I think there's real benefit in male-only spaces, uh, but that in time can work cooperatively with women with anybody and don't have to be exclusively male uh, or exclusively focused on men's issues. If we, but so long as we can advocate for our own issues in a broader, in the broader society. I think I just say that there's don't be reactive and be very, very careful about pointing fingers and blaming someone else for problems. I mean, the best problems we solve are the ones we recognize in ourselves and take it upon ourselves. Let's, you know, uh, if I may be allowed a scriptural reference to take care of the plank that's in our own eye before we go trying to take the specks out of other people's eyes. Right. And I think the whole power of Jordan Peterson's movement was about self responsibility rather yeah. than pointing the finger. Exactly. Um, and look at how well he resonated. You know, I, I'm sorry, I had no time to address Jordan Peterson. He's been an absolutely stupendous phenomenon, especially for young men. He tells you, what? Make your bed. You know, it's the, it, it you know, seems ludicrous. Mom and dad told me to make my bed, you know, my whole childhood. I don't think I ever did. You know, but Jordan Peterson says it and now suddenly, you know, men are making their beds all over the world. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. So let's open it up for, for Q and A. Uh, there are some questions uh, in the chat. Um, uh, there's some comments uh, as well. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, I was curious about th this as well uh, because you paint a pretty dark picture of feminism. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think Matt, Matt and Elderson uh, perhaps was, was, had something to say about that. Um, in his comments. Are, are you there, Matt? Do you want to address your question to, to, uh, to Michael? Are you there, Matt? Okay, maybe he's not there. Um, not if it's there, but perhaps does not want to appear on. Perhaps he doesn't want to. Uh, you know, I, well, I could, um, I, could, I could read what he says and perhaps you can okay. comment, comment to it. Uh, he says, or is he already met? Um, Most of these groups that you mentioned are sex, violent groups indeed that promote hatred against women and other feminist allies, rather than highlighting the importance of man masculinity or male uh, health, healthy identity. I think that was uh, his, his point. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I guess, I guess, um, I guess I'm wondering, are there feminist al allies and is there, is there a good side of feminism? And, and I think that's what he's, he's, his question is reaching. Uh, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I am no specialist on feminism, but I do know what is called first wave feminism, which simply sought equal rights, you know, under the law, 
uh, and equal opportunity. I don't think anybody has any problem with that. I certainly don't. But like we saw Warren Farrell, you know, when he discovered that by the mid 1970s, the feminists who had screamed, oh, equality, 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 now wanted to have absolute control over who got the children in a divorce and that fathers had no say whatsoever. We see that the, so the calls for equality, rather like calls for tolerance, uh, proved to be very thin. Um, as soon as people have power, there ain't much, there ain't much equality uh, left in it. And so where there are, um, uh, in, in third and fourth wave feminism, which tends to be intersectional and all, um, yeah, I have a dimmer and dimmer view of those sorts of things, uh, mostly probably because I am a Southern white Christian male. Uh, and so for me, I am the absolute ogre you know, of contemporary feminism and all that is wrong in the world. Uh, I also happen to have two sons uh, who are living in a world where, uh, you know, their own opportunities are more circumscribed by the claims of other people against them. And, uh, you know, so if we want to talk about equality, fine, let's be equal, you know, but let's be fair about it as well. <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't know how it is in other countries, you know, in the United States, uh, when I turned 18, I had to register for selective service, which meant I registered for the draft, even though the draft had been abolished in the US. I could not get college loans from the government unless I registered for selective service. Women are not required to do this. They go to school and they get, and they get government grants and loans you know, without that burden on them. Is this equal? Um, there are uh, government programs designed to promote when female owned businesses. Okay, I get that. But when women-owned businesses are, uh, get preferential treatment uh, in government contracts, as opposed to a man-owned business, then I think we have a clear case of discrimination here. Uh, you know, there are, there are little things like that. And, you know, uh, again, I, I think there is real discrimination in the court system, especially in cases of divorce, child custody, the, the distribution of assets after, after a divorce uh, that clearly weigh against men. I know I have... There are at least a couple of men who I know are watching here today who have had unhappy experiences with European courts for similar, similar things. So I think some men can appreciate uh, the difficulty there. So yeah, where, you know, where feminism is, is about equality and, and, and promoting women well, where it begins to infringe on my ability to promote my own happiness and my own well-being, then I think we have a problem. And uh, so far, you know, it, it as I say, I don't keep up that much with, with feminism and, and feminist sources simply because I don't have time in the day to do it. Um, but where it, where it is, where anything that is male positive is met with either howls of derision or mockery, they are not yet ready to talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have seen far too much of that. Yeah. So forgive me, yes, my own, my own bias is, is clear in what I said. Uh, forgive me, I meant no overt um, offense when saying that. I simply want to be want to be honest with my own with my own uh, my own prejudices, if you will. Okay, is Albin uh, Schollen? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question uh, to the father, Father Michael? Are you there, Albin? Albin, come forth. Come forth, Albin. Come forth, people. <laughs> no? Oh, no. yeah. So you are. Hey. Um, well, my questions. Yeah. Uh, my, my question is about, well, if maybe we're thinking about, oh, sorry. We may be thinking about too much about why about ourselves and you know we tend to forget about what our ancestors had to do to protect to protect our nations okay you get right mm, because you know there were wars everywhere and you know in europe today men at least in, don't really you know have to go to war mm -hmm. don't face danger in like that so my question is maybe we tend to think too much about ourselves and too little about the bigger picture do you get what i'm saying 
I'm I'm not entirely sure that I do. Are you? Um... Okay, sorry. I'll try to explain better. Okay, uh, you know, instead of, you know, people tend to think about the short term gain for themselves instead of the bigger picture. You know, mm -hmm. because instead of fighting for something that they think are good for mankind, so, sort of, if you know what I'm saying with that, they fight instead for short-term gain instead of going for something that is worthwhile and something that could help other men and women as well. Let me, let me see. Let me, let me try to rephrase this or, or put it in another way. Clear. You tell me if I come close to what, what, what yeah, you're sorry. At. Okay. Um, mm. Yeah. There is a, uh, instead of a look at what might be best, what is best for men in society broadly? And what do men need perhaps to give up in order to have a well-ordered and well-functioning society mm. as opposed to maybe their personal, very masculine goals? Does that come close to what you're, you're, you're saying? Um, kind of. What I'm talking about is maybe we need to think about how... How we should go forward as a species instead of like the short term gain of just short term gain. I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I, I don't really know how to phrase it. Okay. Um, just to take it on that level and to try to bring it back um, to our, yeah. our discussion here. Uh, what I would say is that anything that we do needs to be honest and genuine to human nature and the human experience, that we need to be very careful of ideologies of any kind, because ideologies are partial explanations of, of reality. And because they don't encompass all of reality, sooner or later, somebody gets hurt and the ideologies don't ultimately work out well. So any way forward that is going to make for the flourishing of not only men and women, but since we're talking about men here, that's going to in include the flourishing of men needs to take into account the way that men actually are. And so something has to be done with masculine aggressiveness of competition, uh, of pugnaciousness. Uh, it has to, it, it can't simply be squashed, wished away, drugged out of us. Because look, all of those things in their most positive expression are precisely what made the modern world. You know, it is men's desire to create and to strive and to push and to fight against each other that gave us all of the technological, medical, philosophical advances and all that we have, okay? So we need to find a way to use those things and harness them in, in a way that is beneficial to society, yes. But where we find calls for, oh, no, men cannot be that way or women should not be that way. Um, eventually, the fact that men and women really are that way we're going to find a way around it. We're going to act out in the ways that are natural to us anyway. So somehow we have to, we have to respect who men and women genuinely are. You know? And like I say, that's always my problem with sort of the reimagining of masculinity. I don't think we can reimagine masculinity. I think we, we kind of know what it is and we kind of got to work with what we've got. And that's sometimes messy and it doesn't always fit to the nice little uh, social programs handed down by our governments, but that's the, that's the, yeah, yeah, there you go, Andre, yes. Um, as I say it for the U.S. as well. Uh, but that is, uh, you know, come on, let's be real. Let's be real here and use what's best in men and, and women, you know, for the betterment of society. Don't try to quash what's natural to us. I don't think it ultimately works. And it ends up with very unhappy populations, you know. And then what happens, what happens at least individually you know, when something gets quashed is that, okay, if, if I quash my natural, natural aggressiveness or I need to compete or I need to do something to break out of, you know, my overly peaceful and docile and controlled house, what happens? You know, if I'm a 13 year old boy, I start hanging out on the street corner with the ruffians and, and, and the drug pushers. And next thing you know, I'm in a gang. Or I start drinking and, and you know, and, and smoking pot and doing rougher stuff when I'm 14 or I start getting into fights or causing trouble at school and start acting out in inappropriate ways, okay? And those are the kinds, you know, it's on a small scale, the kind of social ills we see when, you know, human nature is simply ignored. So that's, let me stop there. That's as much as I want to say about that. I okay. hope that comes close to, 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 to answering your question. 
Okay, I have a question from YouTube uh, because actually there's a lot of people watching on YouTube as well. So they're putting questions through. And one of them is, uh, uh, I think, kind of interesting um, in relation to now. Uh, they, they want to know uh, what you think uh, about transgenderism <laughs> and uh, uh, why is this is such a big issue today? And, and why are people so obsessed with, with this transgender uh, issue? And if you have any you know, comments or insights about that. <laughs> I'd hope not to address it here, but I'll, I'll say something very brief about it. Um, I, I don't know that much. I've not read that much by way of anything scholarly and all, except to notice that, or, or to know a recent scholarly article that pointed to a very rapid upsurge in the number of transgendered young women uh, points to the fact that it's more of a cultural thing rather than a genuine biological thing that and ask the question, why don't girls want to be girls anymore? And it may not necessarily be that they want to be boys, but there's something so painful about being a girl in America right now that, that some are, are trying to flee it. Um, I think there's, I think there's uh, deep pathology, uh, social pathology and all that. I think there are a number of young people who are, who are suffering terribly. Uh, I do happen to know uh, one transgendered person um, whose uh, actual life has been a series of train wrecks. He's not that much younger than me now, actually. I think he's in his mid-50s, uh, who has been trying to transition into a woman and was uh, recently uh, castrated, you know, had surgical procedure in order for that to be done. Uh, the man has been wretched and unhappy his whole life, and I have no doubt that he will continue to be wretched and unhappy, you know, trying to, to be a woman now. I think his attempt is to become a new person. It's sort of like a, almost a, you know, a, a take on baptism. Oh, I, I didn't succeed as a man. I can start over in life as a woman. Um, we carry our baggage with us. He's still the same person, you know, with a dick or without a dick. And he's gonna be miserable his whole life because he's not addressing the fundamental issues that's made him miserable in the first place. I'm sorry, I got nothing more than that that, that I can offer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is Wolf there? Would Wolf like to unmute himself and ask uh, his question? Yeah, Mr. Butler, thank you for yeah. your input so far. Uh, you mentioned the spectrum of men's groups, and uh -huh. uh, especially I, I'm in, here in Germany. Uh, I have um, encountered a lot of men's group, which you would describe more to the soy boy nice guy mm -hmm. uh, side of the spectrum. And on the other hand, um, when you could lo look more to the yeah, more masculine side, you often tend to get groups who are and not just new pagans, but also on the right or far right. And there's mm -hmm. oftentimes a lack where you you find normal people from the middle of society and in contrast i see that more in the us and maybe you have um yeah some advice how i can foster these uh, groups which are you know from from the middle of society because i find it very hard to create or join groups here because there aren't any oh those of you who have formed, I mean, I have only formed men's groups in my own churches, uh, you know, as sort of my own experience. Um, like tends to attract like. So, um, and taking a little bit of initiative uh, and willingness to go out and say, hey, you know, let's get together, even for that, let's get together and have a beer, you know, and, uh, and uh, find a common interest. Well, let, take the example, like I say, of the Australian men's shed movement. You know, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom, you know, in their motto, men don't talk face to face, which is one reason that a lot of men's groups don't do so well, because we don't like sitting talking like even though we're doing it on, on Zoom right now. Men like to stand shoulder to shoulder and talk about a prod project. You know, you look under the hood of the car or you watch the game on TV, you know, or you, you do a common project there where you're, 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 you know, you're building something together. And so if you can find opportunities to get together with other men, even just one other man, to stand shoulder to shoulder with him and to look at something and to work on it, you can draw a little closer. And all sorts of conversations come up. I mean, even just to get together around a fire, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, and sit and to have a beer. I've known a couple of men's groups that that's all they do. I knew one in, uh, when I was a priest in, in uh, Cleveland. Uh, that for 15 years, these men got together every Sunday night, summer or winter, 
you know, as long as it wasn't raining, they got together and they sat around the fire. You know, and as they told me, the way men have been since before the time of writing, too warm in the front and too cold in the back. But they sat there and they had a beer. And some nights it was, you know, it was just cheap, shoot the shit, talk. And other nights they held each other's hearts in their hands and helped them through rough times. Uh, authentic community cannot be manufactured. We can simply create an open space in which men are free to open up, you know, themselves. So if you have opportunity to do that for someone, uh, do it. Or go to some of the other groups where, where you can be comfortable, but be yourself. And sometimes simply by being our authentic self, we're able to draw, you know, others towards ourselves. I, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, is Mikael there? Mikael Amark, he says he has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Mikael? Oh, while we're waiting for Mikael. Oh, are you there, Mikael? No. Yeah, just about what you were saying, I, I was curious about this idea of a men's group, because much of, a lot of the men's group work that we've been doing at uh, Manifesto seems to be very project oriented, like making goals, setting goals and getting your life together and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I've been, I've been thinking about that and thinking about that. Yes, that's important. But I've also been thinking that perhaps that we could overdo that, that it might be also just this, just this being with each other in some kind of heartfelt way might be really the most important thing. So, so I'm wondering, you know, um, so I like what you said about the fire, just sitting around the fire and, and that, 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 that seems to me very valuable. Um, uh, how, how do we do that in like the time, this, these COVID times? Like wh what do we do to, to be men in COVID times? That's my question, my next question. <laughs> um, I think, how do we be men in COVID times? I think the same way we are men in all times. Can I just just add something to that? Because because yeah. Paul was talking about a digital patriarchy, about how we could be digi uh, in, in the digital space, right? That we could be men. And I, I'm, I've been wondering about that and it doesn't work for me somehow. And I, I want to hear your view on that. Can I say something on that? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Schlitt, please. Yes, yeah. I'm there. Thanks for giving me the audience. Uh, oh. I'm joining various men's group here in my surrounding in Switzerland. Uh -huh. um, and I can definitely say there is no week I'm not meeting up uh, with my groups. And uh, the most important is it please continue to meet in person. Don't go digital, please. It's mm -hmm. really an important thing to meet and greet. It might be with mask or whatever. Uh, but it's really, really fundamental that we see each other, that we, that we have the body language with our, uh, our parties. The body language is 80% and more of what we speak to each other. You cannot, um, um, uh, how can I say that, um, have that all via uh, a Zoom. That's a nice tool, and I use it every day while work and private as well. But please continue and don't follow this madness of, of not meeting personal. That's really, really very, very keen, key. Thank you. Thank you. And I agree with you completely. Uh, my own men's group at the church, we actually meet one week in person and the next week via Zoom. When we meet via Zoom, we're discussing a book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, and sort of a book discussion works okay on Zoom. We can just sit and talk about the ideas here. But to meet in person, you're absolutely right. I remember when the lockdown first began to loosen up a little bit and I was able to have a congregation in my church again and uh, first just to be around other people. But I remember I, I brushed up against another, I think it was a, an old, older woman in my parish, just my elbow touched her arm and it was like electricity. And there was nothing sexual about that. It was just, my God, another human being to touch another person. We've been apart for so long. And it's true, it, it's, it's very important for, for human well-being. We need each other. And if in lockdown you can only see one other person, well, by God, go see one other person, you know, but at least to do that. And sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, when things are rough, yeah, oh, and, and to circle back to Mr. Sweeney's point, you know, very often a lot of men's work nowadays, it does seem to be rather project-oriented, but men seem to like that and to like goals and to and accountability 
And a lot in men's work nowadays seems to be very much in the self-improvement mold, and uh, which is okay. I, I, I can work with that. Uh, but sometimes you do just need someone to sit there and, uh, you know, to have a quiet beer with because life sucks and, you know, no, you don't want to talk about your feelings. Just shut up and have a beer with me. I just don't want to sit by myself. And that's good too. And men have always sort of known that we know that intuitively when, when we shouldn't talk, when we should just keep our mouth shut, we just need to be there for somebody. And that's all we need is just our presence. And Mr. Schlitz's comment is absolutely right on that. If you ever, if a, if a ma male friend of yours ever just needs you to be there, go and be there for him. Even if he doesn't need a word from you. And that is a, that's, that is a kind of male caring that, that uh, is very important. And we excel at that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Andre has been commenting uh, about the political and financial system. Uh, Andre, do you want to do you want to sort of address your concerns here here to Michael and see what he can um, say about it? Um, yeah, that was more a response to to Albin. Um, I think this is uh, part of also uh, Robert Bly's message that we have Father Sky, Mother Earth. Uh, we even have. Uh, mother sky and father earth so um, in the light of our archetypes and in the light of our characteristics as men how can we create something that is sustainable and nurturing and regenerating mm -hmm. for the planet so I, I see it as a if we truly want to take responsibility and protect life protect women uh, that is the role of men to protect, to channel that aggressive energy towards protection. Uh, it also needs to include uh, the long-term perspective um, and uh, the well-being of community and society. I got no problem with that. I think you're right. And so again, um, you know, a lot of the men's work that I'm familiar with now, uh, as I say, tends to be more of the self-help variety or the self-improvement variety that is not so uh, politically involved you know, or social or policy driven, as it were. I don't know. Uh, I know there are still some that they tend to be uh, uh, more on the left. Uh, that, you know, everyone on the left tends to, you know, for them, the political is the, is the personal is the political. So everything for them is politics. Um, those more moderate or more conservative people such as myself have sometimes have a hard time bridging that uh, bridging that gap. But yeah, there's a voice that needs to be heard there. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of comments in the chat and I'm having a hard time to root out which of these are comments or questions. So if anybody would like to just sort of jump in with, with a question or, or a comment, uh, please do like Paul had something to say. I see Tom or Mark has a question just recently, only because. Ah, Tom has a question. Great. Uh, let's let's hear from Tom. Tom right. is the founder of Parallax. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay. So my question would be, you know, if you look at movements like Black Lives Matter, uh -huh. right, or, or the whole woke movement. So obviously they have a point, and it's a serious and important uh, cultural development. But at the same time. You know, it's like um, they, they're creating this filter and all they, they see suddenly is race and, and problems with, you know, diversity and all of that. And instead of unity, it's like creating more havoc in, in some sort of way. And so how do you deal in regard of the, the men's movement between, say, you know, this, this filter where it creates more diversion and more, more you know, uh, uh, problems and a sort of, well, on the other side, it's, a, it's an important movement, an important way to express uh, authentic malehood. So, you know, it's like, because you're applying this filter, you know, of, you know, of the men's movement. So you're also creating more ways of uh, looking at, you know, looking at the problem and identifying more aspects of it. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think so. So how do you navigate that? Hmm? Uh, here I go back to, um, uh, and I will thank him and publicly again, Thomas Hamelreich's talk at the European Men's Gathering 
uh, this last August. Uh, what I see uh, in Black Lives Matter and in the woke movement is a resurgence of fundamentally just of scapegoating. That is of, of a cancel culture is nothing but a contemporary expression of ancient scapegoating. Rather than taking people outside the village and stoning them to death, we cancel them now. So to circle back to my comments earlier, men's work cannot be reactionary. We cannot blame all of our problems on women or on society or on anybody else. We need to find positive ways of addressing the needs of men and articulating those and fighting for those when they need to be fought for without scapegoating or, or excluding other people. Um, very hard to do, easy to say, I get that, and very hard to do when we are the ones, largely, I look around at you know, those of you who, you know, for, who have pictures or, you know, I mean, we, we seem to be largely white men here. Uh, so we are the bad guys in the world right now. Uh, and so when we are the ones who are put upon, uh, castigated, blamed, it's hard to have the charity to say, look, I feel your pain, but we need to stop this blaming and let's find a way forward here. And uh, as uh, Dr. Hemmelreich had said, you know, at his talk uh, this last summer, uh, one of the fundamental things, it was, it was very brilliant and I, I absolutely loved him for it and I commend him for it. He, he identified himself as an atheist, but he said the Christian church has this. The Christians have a notion of forgiveness that is essential if the world is going to move ahead now. And so, and that is because everything is available online now. Things which you said 10, 15, or 20 years ago can all be found on Facebook or Instagram or on a blog or something. And that is all going to get dredged up and used against people. And we have to be able to look back and say, yeah, he said that. Yes, she did that. But we forgive it. We're going to overlook it. And we're going to move ahead and be positive with something, something good now. And that takes a lot of self-confidence and a lot of self-knowledge. I think we're capable of doing it, though. Uh, it will be painful, and we will still, we'll still get canceled and called out and criticized. There is possibly a, a I don't know. Let me just speculate here for just a couple of minutes. Uh, following upon um, uh, some stuff I learned at the EMG in August as well, I got into good work by Rene Girard, who led me on to some other authors, uh, who had pointed out there is this. Um, there is this scene in Luke's gospel, if you'll allow me to go religious for a moment. In Luke's account of the crucifixion, it says when Jesus died on the cross, that all of the people who were standing around watching the crucifixion, they all went away beating their breasts. Now, the reason they went away beating their breasts was not because they were sorry that Jesus had died on the cross. No, this was the mob that was screaming for his blood six hours earlier. They went away beating their breasts because they didn't get the satisfaction and the relief that they thought they were supposed to get by watching that bastard die on the cross because he was the problem. And they went away sad because it didn't work. Jesus wasn't canceled. You can't cancel Period. Jesus. You can't cancel Jesus. That's right. There you go. There's my line. Thank you. That is my line. <laughs> we can make a good slogan out of that one, I yeah, think, yeah. Michael. But the very next verse in Luke's gospel is the one that really stuck out to me. And his mother and disciples stood off by themselves and watched. And I think the position of, at least the position, my, my, the way I'm formulating is that the position of the Christian church nowadays in all of these cultural wars is not to engage in one side or the other, but to stand apart and to bear witness to what's really going on and what's important, which for Christians is Christ. I think an, an analogous situation could possibly be done, and not just by men's group and men's work, but by anyone who's seriously engaged and worried about where our culture is going, not to engage in right or left or this or that side, but somehow to stand apart and to bear witness to what is, who is wholesome, whole, unifying, good, and positive, and simply to bear witness to that, and not to engage in the battle. I think there's, I think, I haven't come more to articulate that more than what I've just said there, but I think that is a legitimate and a powerful way forward. Um, say I don't, I don't know. I just throw that out there. Maybe there's someone else who can do who can do more with that than I can. No, that's that was beautiful, uh, Michael. Uh, uh, Paul has a question. Paul Lloyd Robson. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I actually wanted to dive into the a little bit of the Christianity thing as well. Uh, 
Uh, so that was appropriate that it was brought up here because uh, so we, we just had a, a talk, Andrew, you and I, um, about this idea um, uh, of, of Augustine and introducing the idea of eternal damnation and um, what was it now again? Original the, sin. Well, I understood that sin. actually yeah. that was not part of the Orthodox tradition. Those yeah, two, yeah, two that's concepts. not a part. Yeah. So but but no. just and so and so you said that this was a part of then a, a Christian worldview, which posits that women are evil and and bad temptresses or something like that is a widespread understanding. Uh, well, it could be it, it, fundamentalist it, 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 Christianity it, it, or something like that. <laughs> so I, I just want to ask for, Father Michael, if do you recognize that kind of understanding in Christian thinking, or why do you think that these these ideas are are quite widespread in, in society? That you know, Christianity is a a, a negative um, force in this. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. First off, yeah. I mean, I think it's easy for sloppy thinkers and people who just like I say, want to scapegoat and to have an, have an easy victim to say, oh, it's all Eve's fault. Um, so we'll just blame her. Though, you know, as I, I, I like to say, you know, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent and the poor serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I, I think it's just sloppy thinking and actually carried forward into, uh, into Reformation era, into Protestant uh, thinking particularly among the in the Calvinist tradition. No, it was actually also in Luther as well. I'm, I'm fairly certain that, um, <clears throat> you know, we were, we were massa damnata. Humanity was just simply a, 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 a mass of corruption and that there was nothing good in us. We couldn't really do anything uh, to even help with our salvation. And we are basically passive victims of God's grace, which I don't know about you, but, you know, for a man, that's not a real hopeful message that I find. Um, to throw in a little plug for orthodoxy, uh, we instead, you know, teach a notion of synergy, where it is 100% God's grace and 100% our effort that together go together to making for one saving act. Uh, yep. I don't. Buddhist, in Buddhism, they call it self power and other power, and there's this conflict between self power and other power, but actually, actually, they're one thing, or they they need to both be um, integrated. I think. Okay. I know I'm a priest, but I don't want, I don't, you know, if, if you've got Christian questions, that's fine, but I don't know if that's of universal interest to people, so. No, well, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think, I think we should speak openly about, about, about Christianity and not, not, not have any trepidation in speaking about it. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's another, another problem with our society and, and, which is why, you know, I like to have Christian people come and talk on Parallax. I'm a Buddhist personally, and I think we have people representing perhaps other religions or atheists or, you know, so that's, that's all good as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, uh, there's, uh, uh, is it Alban who has a question or uh, another question or anybody else? Want to jump in? I have a quick question. It is just that sometimes life is very hard. So when life hits you in the face or sort of that, how do you avoid becoming a victim and stop? And how do you avoid blaming your problems on other, other things and, and instead of looking at yourself and trying to solve your problem, see what I can do to make a difference? All right. Um, first off, I think, um, I would have to, uh, you'd have to discern, you know, why it is you got hit in the face, uh, to be angry and bitter about that might be the most rational response possible. Um, if you're a victim of injustice, you ought to be angry. If you're not mad when you get slapped in the face, there's something wrong with you. Um, you know, being angry and then willing to turn the other cheek if you're strong enough to do that well, uh, you know, we, we can talk about that, you know, if you want to, but, you know, anger is part of human nature is given to us uh, by God in order for us to be angry at injustice and wrongdoing. That's why in the Old Testament, the prophets were always screaming about, you know, the injustice done against the widow and the orphan because they were powerless and people were oppressing them, you know, and God was pissed off about it. And so was the prophets. 
So in some cases, I think we're right to be angry uh, and very justified. And then that, you know, that is what urges us to do something you know, about an unjust situation. Uh, you know, if, you know, if we've uh, been rebuked somehow you know, and it stings because it's really true and maybe we needed to be whumped up the side of the head, then after we've got through being angry, then I think we need to take a step back and say, okay, there's some truth in that. Where am I not living up to my potential? Where have I gone wrong? What am I doing wrong? And use it as an opportunity for self-correction. Okay. Can I, can I say something on top of that, if it's possible? Yes, please. Sure. Okay. I think the first thing is important to make a difference between, is it a real problem here and now? Here and now, let's make a very visual example. If I'm bleeding, it's definitely here and now. So the only thing you can do is try to stop it. And if you find out you cannot stop it, let's take the picture, uh, a snake, a, a very poison snake has bitten you. Um, and there is, you know exactly what kind of snake it is. And there's no chance to get out of it. I think the only thing that helps is surrender. That's, that's one picture. But in the very most cases where we see a problem, it is not here and now. It is coming from our ex uh, experience from the past, or it's about expectations on the future. And if it's about that, then you really like, as well in the Buddhism, for example, and in the Christianism as well, you have to really concentrate that there is not a problem. You just ask the question, where is the problem here and now? And believe me, most of the things will immediately disappear. Pretty sure. There you are. Thank you. There we go. I think, uh, you know, the, a, a question that might be worth uh, talking about is, is ma male violence and, or just violence in general. Because we live in a society where, where you know, we have these physical bodies and, and, and there's been male violence since the beginning of time. Um, and me and Thomas all, all often talk about this, you know, the scapegoat mechanism, whereas mm -hmm. if the violence is not, is not brought up, if, if the violence somehow needs to be expressed and channeled. Um, um, so, so what do we do? What do we do about violence? That's a very, that, that's a very good question. I don't know that I have a, that I have a, an easy. Yeah, it's a big right. question. Yeah. Uh, actually, sort of in response to that, though, um, just by way of spinning a, a little meditation or thought on it, is sort of the question I, I raised at the European Men's Gathering at the end of, of Dr. Thomas's talk. You know, and, and I said, look, in an age such as ours, which is increasingly um, um, uh, rational, materialistic, that scientific, if you will, where metaphor myth and ritual have less of a place and people understand it less and you know, there isn't you know it, it's, it's just not there so much what do you do if you cannot if you cannot ritualize violence mm -hmm. and deal with it in a symbolic way my fear is that the only thing left is that you're going to act it out in a literal way or against yourself yeah and against anybody else. Somebody else, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think we see it when people are running riot in the streets. You know, and you know, I, uh, you know, one of the, you know, one of the central, you know, mysteries of Christianity is the Eucharist, which is which is a, which is a, uh, you know, not only a reenactment of the Last Supper of Christ, but is also a representation of His crucifixion and death. And so it is a ritual making present of an act of violence for the Christian community now, which when well understood and participated in, I think ritually dispels some of that impetus towards violence. When we don't have things like that, or uh, I, I'm coming up short for other cultural analogs uh, to use. Actually, my, my, my fear was, which, uh, <laughs> we've, uh, I, you know, I thought that when the, the, the lockdown came, and Americans were deprived of American football and basketball and soccer and baseball and all, that the amount of stress would go through the roof and you know the homicide rate would go up as well. Uh, that that didn't happen because here you know well like in Europe you have your football where you know there is so much uh, psychological energy is put on these teams and on these players and all that you know it, it it's 
it's it's it's a you know it's it, so much energy is released in these matches that if you don't have them, where the hell does that energy go? You know, and it's it's a ritualized combat. Sports is always a ritualized combat. You know, so if we don't have these opportunities to do it, I don't know where it comes out. I, I I'm you know I've suicide rate I know is going up in the U.S. Anx anxiety and depression rates are going up right now. Uh, I see in my own parish, I see incidents of self-medicating behavior among parishioners, uh, you know, all trying to cope with stress because we do not have the normal ways of releasing that. So yeah, I don't know what we do with violence. Mm -hmm. I think we've been trying to deal with violence for a very, very long time. And I think this, so excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite, uh, because there's a guy here called Thomas Hammer who is known in, in our community as the hammer. <laughs> so, 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 uh, and he, we and him talk a lot about uh, the scapegoat uh, um, uh, uh, phenomenon and, and Rennie Girard. So mm -hmm. are you there, Thomas? Do you want to comment on that in terms of our discussion? Can I bring you in here? Oh, there you are. Hi. Hey, Father Michael, good to uh, to see you again and to uh, to hear your uh, your your very uh, interesting um, presentation. I like that you also highlighted the, the the less positive sides of the of the men's movement. I thought it was very very honest. Um, right. Let's. But but let me. I, is it okay if I ask a question about Christianity? Sure. So. So I think that Christianity is, is actually extremely uh, relevant for these times because, again, you mentioned it, it exposes this, this scapegoating me mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, that, that is really the, the, the core of Christianity, that, that we have that in us, that we scapegoat people. And that's the way that we basically get rid of, of tension in, in the, into society. Um, so the question is, why is that not appreciated? Why do people turn away from Christianity because it's one of the it's not a cool thing to say right I'm a Christian nowadays so yeah. why is that and and what could you do about it that's a very good question I think um being vast and a uh, overwhelmingly western cultural phenomenon now I think that um uh, sometimes the core message gets lost um in, in my own case being an orthodox Christian there are so many pretties that people get engaged with. People like the Jesus prayer. They like our icons. They like our devotion to the mother of God. You know, they like all this stuff. You know, uh, people, and a wise priest here told me, says, people come to us looking for Christ and we give them orthodoxy instead. And I think a lot of churches do something similar. They come looking for, for genuine Christianity, for the germ of the gospel that will transfigure their lives and we give them everything else instead. So I think a, a radical return to our own roots and to the centrality of the Christian gospel, which is precisely the, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, is the first place that we have to go. Uh, secondly, um, I would point to this. Um, um, one of uh, Girard's disciples in America by the name of Gil Bailey wrote this fascinating article uh, <clears throat> on the uh, Vine and Branches discourse. But in there, he talks about uh, the fundamental problem of the, the, the Christian West was the, uh, to take the gift of personhood and to make it absolute. And so for him, sort of the cardinal sin from at least the, 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 uh, uh, the Enlightenment era on is this notion of radical individualism that I define everything by my own terms. He, like, he ties it back to the parable of the prodigal son, which you may know that the son went to the father, says, give me my inheritance. And he does not want to receive his inheritance as a gift from his father, but something to own in his own right. And he takes it and he goes off and he spends it on prostitutes and drinking and ends up in abject poverty. And then he ends up becoming enslaved to a man there to feed pigs. And then there's a famine in the land, which is the cultural famine that comes when we do not accept our own person as a gift. So I think part of the, and he comes back to the father and the father of course receives him and is reconciled with him. But the point of it is that to recognize that we are not these atomistic individualist uh, units, but that rather what we have we receive as gift that we are, we, we exist because we're first of all seen and loved by God. 
And having had this experience, are able then to return that to God and to return, give the same experience to someone else so that we give ourselves as gift to my brother or my sister in order to open up to, to them the same experience in, in, in self-giving back. And this is what creates, I think, an authentic community and a relationship that's not uh, formal and um, um, transactional, but rather relationships that are transformative and deeply interpersonal. So I think a return to the centrality of the gospel and the work that Christ did, precisely as, as Girard talks about, you know, sort of overcoming the sort of scapegoat mechanism, which then leads to self-criticism and humility rather than criticizing others, correcting oneself first, and then also the understanding that, yes, yeah, Jesus loves us, but that does something to me and requires that I in turn learn to love the same way as I have been loved, but to that experience of it first. So to put it in other terms, what uh, was said to Christ at his baptism, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when we can recognize that we are beloved sons of God and not just know it here or intellectually, but know it deep in our hearts, that will change us. And that will change our relationship to everyone and everything else around us as well. So thank you for the question. I hadn't thought about it quite in those terms in, in, in a good while, but I think that's where I would go. And you know, that's, I think you have the, the subjects of my sermons again, Thomas, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, for some Sundays coming up here. But I think, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think we, we, have, missed, we have misplaced our attention for too long. And the, the difficulties of the days we find ourselves in require us a radical recentering on the core of our own message. But, but in that sense, you can, uh, can kind of see all this wokeness you kind of see this as a, a fantastic opportunity because yeah. it exposes the scapegoating that is in us and that is all around us if you don't channel it through, through religion. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very exposed and, and it, it's actually very obvious to, to then point back to the gospel and say like, well, this is, this is the core of Christianity. It's the warning of, of the, the mob that, that goes after the individual and kills it. Because that's essentially where the obsession of Christianity with the individual comes from. It's because yeah, yeah. it's the individual that stands against the mob. And that's why, why I think that the Psalms are, are an absolute essential part of the Bible, even though they are often seen as violent and archaic. But what people don't understand is that the, the, the persons who are speaking in the Psalms they are individuals who are facing a mob of murderers. And if you read it from that perspective, then the, their imagery is not violent, but it's, it's the desperation of the individual that is facing a, a nameless mob. Absolutely. And in a, a little more, in, in a little more Christian context, first of all, the Orthodox sing the Psalms at every single service that we have. They for us, they are for us, the, the fundamental hymns of the church. And secondly, the way we read the Psalms is that we read them all Christologically. They are either about Christ or they come out of his mouth. And when we read them in that way, it is very, very close to exactly what you said. Someone who is set upon by a mob, someone who is a victim. And then you're right. They make incredible sense when you read them in that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Uh, it made me think of Jonathan Paggio's insight also that he says that within the Christian story, there's a death and resurrection. So Christianity is sort of has to kind of die to be reborn in, in some sense. And maybe that we're, 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 a, we're, we're experiencing this, this period where like you, you almost had to apologize for, for speaking about Christianity uh, in the secular culture. Um, yeah. Right. So because, because, because Christianity is so, uh, um, you know, looked down upon in, in some kind of a way. So, um, so, so uh, and then when you said that there's this, this wokeness, which is sort of like, it's kind of pseudo Christianity where, where, where the, the, you know, the, the innocent victim is, is raised up and, 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 um, you know, and then, but there's not this aspect of mercy or, or atonement or, right. Right. No, I don't see much mercy in the woke crowd. You know, and woe betide anyone who falls into their hands. Yeah. And frankly, I do believe them when they say, you know, they want my God erased, my church raised to the ground, 
and me hung with the entrails of the last lawyer or the other way around, however Voltaire had it. I can't remember if it's, if it's my entrails or the lawyer's entrails that do the hanging. Um, but uh, yeah, frankly, I believe them. It's okay, we have time. about five minutes left, right? Yeah, normally we're doing two hours where it's, it's been very intense and we, we want to go very deep and that's that's the whole point. Okay. Uh, uh, so we have five minutes I, left. So, so do, do, do would you like to make some final comments or do we have a last question? Or Sorry, go ahead, uh, Michael. Yeah, uh, actually I see it. Johan here uh, asked a question. The movie I mentioned during my presentation that initiated the transformative moment for me. Yeah, it was a movie starring Bruce Willis. It was called The Kid. And in this movie, uh, Bruce Willis, as an eight-year-old boy, appears in his life later on. And Bruce Willis, as an adult, is this total bastard. He's this hard-edged businessman with no empathy or sympathy for anybody. He is he's a piece of work. And this eight-year-old kid shows up in his life, and it's himself as an eight-year-old boy. And they realize this, and he gets to see the moment that hardened his heart. It happened when he was eight years old and they both relived the scene at the same time. And it just so happens that I lost my father to an industrial accident when I was eight years old. And the kid in the movie looked very much like me. And it was so personal, a reenactment of what had happened to me. It opened up a flood of grief that I had not felt for my father's death in 40 years. I had no idea that, that was still in me. And uh, uh, like I say, we were in a studio, we were in this big auditorium, here's like 450 good evangelical Christians. And they started this scene and I saw what happened. I, I sit way over on the far left because I'm left-handed and I, I didn't want to offend anybody writing, you know, and I said, oh shit. In the, I sort of echoed in this room and, and, and Evangelists, evangelicals tend not to say that. I, I'm a native Texan. I, I sometimes I'm a little saltier in my language, but I just put my books under my chair. I sat down on the step, and as soon as everybody filed out, uh, the floods came, and I, I didn't I didn't move for 45 minutes. It was it was an incredible thing, and the 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 release of that much grief, which I did not even know I had been holding, was incredibly liberating. I've only had like two moments like that in my whole life. Uh, and uh, like I said, you, you cannot force those moments. They're moments of grace. They happen when they happen. And sometimes the best we can do, like I think we did it at the EMG back in August, we created a very a firm container in a very good space where men could open their hearts and create moments of grace and moments of transformation. And I know it happened for a number of men because they told me so afterwards, so. You know, we, we can do very good work. And if you're engaged in men's work, please continue. God bless you for what you're doing. The world needs it. Other men need it. If you're not engaged in doing men's work, get into a group somewhere. Find another man where you can do something together. Uh, the very first thing that God said was not good in the Bible, he said it is not good for man to be alone. And too often we try to fight these battles by ourselves and we end up in a bottle or we end up in drugs, or we end up lying in our basement covered in Doritos chips, you know, playing video games until 3 a.m. and wasting away our lives if we don't do worse. Um, so find another man, find a men's group, and, you know, and, and, and become the best men that you can possibly be. That's ultimately what I, you know, uh, my fundamental message and all that I, I try to be about in my men's work. I want you to be the best men you can be for yourself, for your families, for your communities, and ultimately for the world. So go and do that. And don't wait for the damn virus to be over before you start. Go start right now. <laughs> okay. That's the message. That's the core of your, your message, I think. And so it's probably a, a good time to, to, to thank you uh, for, for such a long and rich uh, evening. Um, and I also to point out that all the people in this group are men. There's not a single woman who woman who dared to come, and that that was not by design because the women were welcome. But there's no women here, <laughs> which is interesting. I, I, um, I looked around before you before I said, "Well, God, God, you know, if they're if they are watching on YouTube, well and good." Um, I hope and, some some women will watch on YouTube. Sure, you um, know, but you know, as I as I like to to finish all these things I, because I don't know all of you in the audience or who all may be watching, 
you know, down the line, you know, my, my intent is, is never to give offense. So please forgive me if in anything I have, I try to be informative as, as best I can. I appreciate that I get passionate about some things and sometimes maybe overstep boundaries a bit, but uh, in all things, I wish you well. Okay, so thank you, Father Michael, and thank you, Paul, uh, from the EMG. Uh, this is and uh, this is the first Parallax Manifesto joint presentation. So, so thanks a lot for for doing this, and and uh, thanks for all the guys for for being here. All righty, thanks too much, guys. Appreciate it. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you.